Hello and welcome to Cody and Corbin Have a Podcast, the show where two former roommates, and they were talk roommates. About a new movie every week. This week on the show, we're talking about war dogs. Now to a question that still has no clear answer. How did two 20-something young men land a $300 million Pentagon contract? I have a big idea. They call guys like us war dogs, bottom feeders who make money off of war without ever stepping foot on the battlefield. Show you about my soldier. It was meant to be derogatory, but we kind of liked it. We don't play fair. Sorry, Excuse kind me. of an emergency. Sorry, don't worry, I have to go first, I'm American. As always, I'm your host, Corbin's Vocal, and joining me is uh, my fellow war dog, Cody Webb. Cody, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Very excited to be here. Another great intro from you, but uh, yeah, I think we are, you know, pretty good dogs, so this what we apply to as well. But uh, yeah, it should be a good episode, I think. Uh, a good pick from you. Great episode. Great episode to hear Cody in a microwave. Uh, it's going to be a great, great <laughs> one all around. Yeah, we are going, going through some audio changes here. So we're going through the AirPods today. We'll see how the quality is, but uh, next week we should, be, we should be back, excuse me, to the, uh, the neural mic. But uh, yeah, if this episode's a little scratchy, you know, I'll, I'll definitely take the blame for it. <laughs> so why did I pick War Dogs? Why? 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 In all honesty, I really just kind of wanted an excuse to rewatch this movie to a certain degree. Uh, I don't know what it is. I kind of like it. I mean, I don't think it's like that great necessarily, but I just enjoy watching it. And it's just a fun one to kind of return to. And it, it's a pretty easy watch. Uh, it's not too long. It's got a good cast. Um, and while the subject matter, you know, can be a little bit controversial at times, all in all, I think it is a, is, is a good movie to return to. It's, it's kind of like my first pick, Men in Black, just an easy watch. So pull up Netflix, go check out War Dogs and uh, come back and listen to our <laughs> thoughts. So just say you describe it as um, an easy watch, but well, I mean, just the subject matter, like it's about war, but it's not really about that at all. That's our same, I guess, but I mean, I don't know if I agree. It's like a super fun watch, but uh, I think this is a good pick. I, I would probably prefer this over Men in Black um, because of like conceptually, I like a lot of the ideas, but uh, yeah, I can pick from you. And uh, I, I was surprised. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this movie, honestly, but uh, yeah, good pick. Thank you. Let's uh, get into our initial thoughts right off the bat. Good morning, Vietnam! I'm curious to hear what you think, Cody. Yeah, I'll definitely start off. So I think this is the second time I've seen this movie. And um, I didn't even realize Todd Phillips directed it, if I'm being completely honest. Um, but I, I like the first time I watched it, it was like a year ago. So I don't know how I missed that. But uh, I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, he primarily came from comedy. And then just recently he kind of had a, you know, change of career path. I mean, it kind of started with this movie, which is weird. Um, Because there is a lot of comedy, but it is a lot more just like, uh, you know, like tension based, more drama stuff. I I would say it's more drama than than a comedy. Um, It's almost like a political thriller in a way mixed in with a comedy. Um, And and I I agree 100%. It's interesting to see the way his career's transitioned. You wonder if that is necessarily by choice or maybe kind of the way the industry has gone moving away from comedies obviously i mean he made like three hangover movies or at least uh yeah, worked on three hangover <laughs> movies and then you know did this and a star is born and joker and uh, or produced a star is born he, he obviously has a relationship with bradley cooper uh which is very clear so i think this is like a cool new direction for him so i mean coming off three hangover movies you probably need to do something different. And uh, I think there's a good turn, like a, a fun way to describe this. I mean, I think maybe is like, it's kind of like the big short, but in the military. Um, Cody, you're, like, hit, you're hitting right away. on the head of what I wanted to talk about. I love this. <laughs> Go on, continue. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, Jonah Hill, he's got a great laugh. Uh, one of the <laughs> iconic laughs. What Talk is about that? about the Joker's laugh. I'll take <laughs> Jonah Hill's laugh. I want to hear your impression of it. I think it's a little... It's like... (laughs) It's like he's orgasming almost every time he laughs. It's very strange. (laughs) Yeah, it's very strange. And kind of the big thing for me is where this movie works is Jonah Hill's 
and um, what is it, Miles Teller? Nice Miles life. Teller, excuse me. Yeah, their kind of relationship, I really like. And like rewatching it again, it does kind of seem like Jonah Hill or his character, whatever his character's name is, some Ephraim Diveroli. Ephraim, yeah, there. Oh, it's Italian. I think, I'm sorry. I think it's but, Jewish, <laughs> Cody. It's yeah. not Italian. <laughs> What does that say? Like rigatoni or something? Div- Divaroli. So I guess yeah, it's continue. It is a lot of Jewish characters, which is good representation. But um, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't like say good representation. It is representation. Well, not Ephraim, but you know, like the dry cleaning guy in Wild Teller. That's good representation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but uh, his character, I think, is super interesting, and especially on a rewatch, you, you kind of are seeing like this guy is acting through the entire thing. Um, at least I think. Um, and the second time through, I, I did enjoy it more than the first. So whatever that means, you know, props to that. But yeah, o- overall, like I do like this movie. I, I think it's a solid role play. Yeah. I think I agree hundred percent. Like the Jonah Hill performance, it's just another example of him being really good in a role where he's both being funny and being serious and in this, you know, he's, he's playing a real life person. He's kind of embodying a different sort of being a little bit. Uh, I think to the Wolf of Wall Street and his performance on that, it's, it's kind of a similar thing. And I kind of, you mentioned the big short and I wanted to bring up this like greater of what I have kind of heard described and, and kind of see is like this Obama era movie and this like looking back on like the early 2000s and it's very much, it's interesting to see a movie like this, a movie like The Big Short, even The Wolf of Wall Street, um, which, you know, 2013, 2015, 2016, that time period when we were like in the second term of Obama, where it's like, oh, America's doing so great. Everything's great. Let's make movies about how awful the 2000s were and how Dick Cheney and Bush ruined America, which like, I do agree, like generally agree with those sentiments, but it's kind of interesting to kind of look at the movies that were being made then. I mean, this movie comes out in 2016. Obviously, Trump gets elected president uh, a couple months later. And the movies and kind of the political landscape of the kind of stories we were telling are very much not like these (laughs) at this point. And then you get movies like Don't Look Up in the like Trump era and like the response to that. Um, but I think this is an interesting, like time capsule of the period it was made. It was right before America really took this big, at least big prominent, uh, like displayed turn to the right almost, or in a return to that. And I I think it's, it's definitely curious to look at a movie that focuses so much on the war and and the profiteering of both rich people and then the government itself. Um, so I, I think it's cool to talk about that. And I think also in tandem with, looking at Goodfellas last week and some of the, dis- or two weeks ago, the discussions we had about Goodfellas and the Wolf of Wall Street and hell, at the end of this movie, somebody turns state witness, Cody. I mean, it's like, I guess we just have, we just can't stay away from these type of movies. I, I don't know what it is. And I guess that's on us. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. And um, there are actually a couple of parallels to uh, Goodfellas that I saw. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Miles Teller uh, voiceover <laughs> similar to Goodfellas. And as well, Bradley Cooper's glasses, dude. It's the exact same as, as Bobby De Niro. So I think maybe it was, I mean, like there's always plot points in these kind of movies, like you said, in, in The Wolf of Wall Street as well, that are all similar. And the endings especially are all, all very similar. But yeah, it's kind of funny. Maybe, you know, Todd Phillips had a little, he had a little direction from, you know, Scorsese. So I think that's cool. Maybe a little homage, at least, with, with those glasses. Uh, unless, you know, the real war profiteer wore those big-ass goggles on his face, which is possible. But <laughs> he does look like Bobby D. in those things. Henry Gerard. Uh, I don't know what kind of weird glasses. He's, he's, it looks like an interesting-looking character in real life. <laughs> um, so uh, any other initial thoughts about this movie, Cody? Uh, that, that was pretty much the gist of it. I will shout out Ana de Armas as well, just because it's Ana de Armas. But uh, let's get the fun fact out of the way, Corbin. Uh, you know what I'm going to say, right? Uh, let's yeah, hear yeah, from yeah. you. <laughs> oh, you want me to say it? <laughs> All right. Yeah, my uh, yeah, so, I mean, when this is essentially her entrance into mainstream American movies, uh, so much, in fact, that she didn't even really speak English 
when she was making this movie, she memorized her lines phonetically and the directors and, and the producers didn't even know this. And it wasn't until they changed a the line and then she didn't know how to pronounce it that they like, were like, oh wait, you can't even like really have a conversation with us about this. Um, they put her into English sessions and she ended up learning English very quickly because as she said, her life essentially depended on it, which is a little unfortunate that she felt so stressed, but um, shout out to her for, I guess, putting in the hours. Uh, but it, I guess that's just a fun, cool anecdote. I don't even know, it, it might not even be 100% true. You know, these things kind of come about. It might be a little bit, a uh, little bit of a mistelling, but it, it's a fun story nonetheless. Yeah. And we've talked about it multiple times before. And I mean, when you watch the movie, I feel like, like that vibe 100% comes off. You know, I don't want to talk her, but this isn't like the best performance, especially from out of here, Mas. But like, she doesn't know how to speak English. So in context, I think it's actually a really good performance just because she just is saying. And I mean, it words. does fit the character. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's playing a person in Miami of Latino descent who, you know, probably immigrated here. So like, it, it does make sense. Um, but like you, you can kind of tell a little bit like, okay, yeah, that she, she doesn't quite understand what she's saying at certain points. Uh, but I think overall it's a pretty good performance nonetheless. Yeah. I think she's okay. But in context, I think she's good. <laughs> yeah, I don't think right. she's very good in this movie. So I'm being honest, but I love Anna Dermas. She's one of my favorite, you know, actresses working today. But you know, if you can't really, you know, speak the language you need to i mean if you stuck us difficult. in a spanish film i mean we took <laughs> spanish class cody we couldn't do it no shot i'm gonna be terrible yeah i'm gonna be the worst performance of all time so the fact that she was even okay is super telling of how good of an actress she is i think yeah yeah <laughs> the last thing that i wanted to talk about is the them getting gas in fallujah scene cody uh mm. kind of just like <laughs> this absurd moment and you're and then the u.s government comes in and saves the day whatever the military but the funny thing is this actually happened to the screenwriter of the film. It didn't happen to the characters, but the screenwriter spent some time in Iraq because he was trying to write a movie about different people. It kind of this weird situation where he went to Iraq to write a movie about other people. And then Todd Phillips came to him to write this story because he wrote that script and blah, blah, blah. But basically he was driving through Iraq. They stopped in Fallujah to get this free gas, quote unquote. And then, you know, the, uh, militants taliban arrived taliban. yeah the taliban arrived and <laughs> was chasing them down the street only to be saved by just happenstance of the military come coming the opposite direction which i think is a fun anecdote and i think it's something that's kind of overarching there's a lot of when they go to iraq there are some interesting like details and little moments that kind of make it seem more real obviously neither of us know what that's like but it's very clear that it was written by someone who at least spent some time there during the 2000s and, and kind of saw what the war effort was like yeah and that is a very cool detail I, I did not know that at all and um that's one of my favorite scenes that might be my favorite scene um <laughs> where marlboro's you know running to get back on the truck and they get saved last minute and the army soldiers are flipping them off i think that's hilarious but uh that's crazy I actually happened that guy that's pretty scary but uh it makes pretty good tv so yeah it is yeah. what it is i guess <laughs> use real life experiences yeah. Just the harshest one's awesome, I guess, but that is a dope scene. That's that's probably top two scene for me in the movie. So respect. All right, let's move on to roll credits. Roll credits. We kind of hit on it a little bit, but I think the first thing I want to talk about is just I mean, Todd Phillips directing this movie. It is definitely I'm sure at the time, I, I didn't see this when it came out, but I'm, I'm sure when it came out, people were like, oh, Todd Todd Phillips' next movie? Yeah, let's go see this. I, I love The Hangovers. And then you go to the theater and you're like, <laughs> I mean, this is kind of funny, but it's also kind of about how <laughs> the political landscape is, has been ruined by greed and capitalism and American <laughs> imperialism, uh, which is kind of interesting. Obviously, then he goes on to make The Joker, which is almost another turn away from this. Um, and then, hey, we're getting Joker 2 coming soon. Yeah, interesting. There's been a lot of casting for that recently, too, which has been questionable. So I'm kind of worried about that movie. But uh, yeah, you're saying there's no like big themes or anything in the Hangover trilogy? Because uh, I think you might be wrong there. But yeah, Top Films, I mean, I, I talked about it a little bit already, but I think he is a good director, surprisingly. I can't believe I'm really saying that. But I mean, this movie, Joker, and I do like the first Hangover a lot, too. I'm a sucker for that movie. So, I mean, I think maybe stuff about himself. due date. 
<laughs> I would say that RDJ though. Um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't check it out. But <laughs> it's I not heard good. It's not a terrible thing. <laughs> really, <laughs> I've heard it's okay, but yeah, I probably wouldn't check it out. But yeah, for for roll credits, I did as well want to talk about the title because I think it's actually a really good one. I think maybe it's it's one of the stronger titles we've talked about. Um, and I think they say it fairly early in the movie, maybe like a half hour or so. They they explain what a war dog is. And, so like it's kind of this this term people say to you know make fun of us or whatever kind of a derogatory term, um, but they love it. Like they love being war dogs. They love their roles. Like in this war, I think it's cool. I, I think it's one of the like I said the stronger aspects of the movie as a whole. So shout out war dogs. Cool title. Yeah, I think it's definitely like almost like a meta self commentary where it's like they mention the movie about it being an insult, but they think it's like so cool that they they wear it as a badge of honor. It's almost the same thing of like we're going to title this movie war dogs, which is like an insult about these people, but it's also like a sick title for a movie. <laughs> and it kind of just comes full circle there, which is, is fun. The other thing, this isn't necessarily credits within the movie, but it is text that appears on screen. And it's just this yeah. throughout the movie, basically these like black screens appear with a quote that kind of leads you in because it's going to be said later in the movie. Ana de Armas says a couple of, or at least one of them. And then I think pretty much the rest of them are said by Jonah Hill's character. Um, but a few of them, God bless Dick Cheney's America. These aren't crumbs. This is the whole fucking pie. Uh, when does telling the truth ever help anyone? That sounds illegal. If I wanted you dead, you'd be dead already. That's a Bradley Cooper line. Bradley um, Cooper. But yeah. what do you think about that convention that they use? Yeah, it's definitely interesting. I feel like it's not really something you see a lot. It reminds me of like chapters to a book, and I don't really like it. If I'm being totally honest, it seems pretty unnecessary. But if like they're just basing it like off the action of the script, like that makes sense. But it's definitely an interesting choice, like uh, editing and you know directorial wise. But I'm not a massive fan. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I'm not honestly a huge fan of it either. And we'll kind of talk more as we get into our next category. But like there's some things that this movie does really well in moments, but then it's super inconsistent throughout whether it's cinematography choices, editing choices. And this is one of them where it's like, okay, we're going to structure this like in a break it up into acts, but like none of the acts really seem to like work for me as like individual little pieces. It doesn't start with a quote. So it like kind of introduces this like 20 minutes into the movie and then it starts following it. And to me, it's just kind of a little bit jumbled and mismanaged. And I think it's like a good seed of an idea that could have been better executed. Yeah. And I think maybe they just use it a little bit too much too. Like there are a couple of good ones. Uh, the Bradley Cooper one, I like a lot. And that'd be really cool if they kind of just like, if they did like one at the beginning and one at the end, I think that'd be pretty cool. But some of them are just like, what's the point of even having this in here? Like, uh, and it's, it, it's kind of a cool tie-in throughout the movie, but it, it seems unnecessary mostly. Some of them, like, I mean, I guess generally, like, the quote you can attribute to, like, what is the thematic message of this singular part of the movie? But, like, in reality, most of the quotes could probably be interchanged for any moment in the movie. It's not really set defined for this particular story structure like Anna is saying that sounds illegal they're doing illegal shit the entire fucking time so it's like <laughs> just because she says it later when they're doing one thing that's like sounds illegal it's like everything <laughs> they're doing is illegal so i don't know i think the one that works is the when does telling the truth ever help anyone because it's the first one and it is successful and then after that it, it like you said it kind of goes downhill yeah so maybe if we were re-editing this, maybe keep that one in and the Bradley Cooper one in. But I think it's also just like maybe the writers being like, oh, that was a great line. I really want to show that off. Like kind of like trying to up their one line a little bit because they think it's cool. I don't know. Like I said, I haven't really seen that too much in anything else. So it's definitely an interesting choice. All right, let's move on to the good, the bad, the ugly. start with the good Cody um I'll get us started and we talked about it already a little bit but just introducing us to Ana de Armas that's great she's obviously oh, yeah. become a pretty big mainstay uh in American culture uh gonna be potentially Oscar nominated at least we think so um if you listen to our episode <laughs> last week and uh yeah she's just a fantastic actress and 
she was in Blade Runner 2049 the year after this. And obviously just has kind of, you know, she's been in a Bond movie. She was unfortunately in The Gray Man, Knives Out, um, has been pretty successful. Yeah, no, she's great. And um, that was kind of the first thing I wanted to hit on as well. Um, in hindsight, I think the cast is actually really, really good. Um, Miles Teller, he's been pretty consistent doing this for a while. And then this is kind of like the start of, well, I don't know, when, when this movie come out, like 2016 or 16, something? so it's after I mean, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, so for Jonah Hill, it's not his coming out party, but it's more establishing like what he's going to do going forward after, after Wolf of Wall Street, and, and a really good performance from him as well. And like you said, Ana de Armas, you got Bradley Cooper as well. So, I mean, this is a very good cast um, for a Todd Phillips directed movie coming off some Hangover movies. So I think that's really good. And then I think that's what else is like good about this movie. It's just like specific scenes that stick out to me. And the two that did stick out, you already talked about one, the, you know, the gas run with, with the army saving them. And then kind of just the lead up before that too, where they have to go to Jordan, they have to do all that crap. And then they hook up with Marlboro. <laughs> and he's talking about 50-50. <laughs> What, what do you mean 50-50? <laughs> Clearly, he doesn't know what 50-50 means. That's my favorite scene of the movie. I, I think that's hilarious. And um, just that entire run that they have to do, uh, like, to Baghdad, I think is the peak of the movie. Um, so, yeah, kind of just like the cast, and then um, those couple scenes combined are, are definitely my biggest positives. Before we go to the bad, I, I guess I'll do good and bad here. I said mm-hmm. how some of the stuff is inconsistent. I think the cinematography at moments is like, there's shots that I'm like, oh, wow, that is so fantastic. There's the, when they're being chased in Fallujah, the shot in the mirror where it's like objects in the mirror closer than appear, and it does the, the focus pull, um, the helicopter over the sun with fortunate sun playing, um, him in the hall, Jonah Hill in the hallway after he finds out that they lost out on $53 million and he's like punching the wall and the camera kind of like does this move in on him. Um, there's also the shot where, uh, Miles Teller's kind of just standing there and he over he's like we're out of our league and there's the red dot sight on his chest there's just like a lot of cool like yeah. imagery but then there's also stuff where it's like this is just really weak and uninteresting for a lot of it it's just a couple moments stand out I back that and um I think there were some cool shots at the gun convention kind of the one that you were saying with with the red dot on his chest I thought was was super cool and then there was a couple <laughs> with Jonah Hill there too which are more comical but I think it, like it is kind of shot interesting and I just shout out, you know, Todd Phillips again. I think, again, that's not really something we saw in the hangover series too much, but I mean, moving on to Joker, there's a lot more of that stuff. So yeah, I back everything you're saying there. I actually want to continue on with bad and say that I actually don't like Jonah Hill's laugh that much. It's actually pretty annoying. <laughs> uh, I could probably do without it. <laughs> The thing is, maybe, like, I don't know if the guy actually laughed like that. Then I guess it's understandable. But Jonah Hill never met him in person. So it might have just been a character choice that he decided to make. I, I'm, I'm honestly unsure. Interesting. <laughs> but uh, I'm surprised he didn't meet him. Part he refused. He wouldn't meet so. with him. He uh, didn't <laughs> want, Ephraim Differoli said, no, I will not meet with you. Well, that's fair from Ephraim, I guess. But, uh, yeah, his last terrible. But. Now, Cody, in the, he, in the he whole did not meet, like it. Jonah Hill did not meet Ephraim, but we do know mm-hmm. someone who did meet Ephraim Diveroli. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that. And you ignored me. Oh, I, it cut out. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, Jonah Hill didn't even meet Ephraim, but our boy Carter <laughs> did meet Ephraim. Wild, wild scene. He dropped the bomb on us. Let's roll the clip. Let's hear what Carter has to say. <laughs> All right, Carter, can I get your uh, official opinion on the character that Jonah Hill plays? <laughs> and go. All right. So once, if he's listening, I'm sorry. I don't remember his name, the gentleman's name. I think it's Ephraim Devarelli or something. Devarelli, yeah. Ephraim Devarelli. Oh, God, I'm good. Um, once, uh, I, you know, I work for a company and we, uh, we insure risks and uh, we in, uh, inv- invest consultancies, things like that. Do fake things, yeah. Yeah, we don't do real things. And um he's met with us once and wanted to uh, insure against some risks. And um, we did not know um, who he was prior to the meeting until the CPA we worked with was 
uh, alerted us and said, oh, you've seen the movie War Dogs? It's that guy. Um, so, yeah, he was an interesting guy. Great guy. Nice guy. We did not do business with him. Uh, didn't want to get involved in uh, the baggage that he has, even though, you know, the government kind of screwed him. Right. So spoiler alert for War Dogs. Right? Whatever. True of all great stories. <laughs> yeah. Screwed um, by the government. Yeah. So that's my War Dogs. Story. Thank you for that. <laughs> Wow. Beautiful stuff right there. Uh, sounds like a great guy. Really sad I missed out on that meeting. <laughs> yeah, very uh, unfortunate we weren't there as well to, to witness that that character. But uh, yeah, I, I do agree going back. Like that laugh is terrible, but I think it, it fits for the character very, very well. Uh, but I could definitely do without it. So I agree. My specific bad, I did want to point out more of a plot, plot stuff. Uh, I mean, once we get past the whole, you know, Jordan to Iraq, I feel like the movie kind of doesn't know what to do. Obviously, we're going to get to the end where everything blows up, but they kind of need a reason to bring Bradley Cooper back into, or I guess just into the fold in general. Um, and as well, just like the moment where it's the big blow up. And it's all circled around Albania. which I think everything in Albania is a little bit slow, a little bit boring. I think this movie's maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes longer than it could have been. You really could have shaved some time off there, especially if Ephraim's going to, you know, just just screw over uh, Miles Teller. I feel like we can just cut to the cut to the chase on that a little bit more quickly. Um, but yeah, kind of just like pacing in the third act was my main issue for plot wise. I, I agree 100%. There's like moments that just don't make a whole lot of sense, like when they're forging three years worth of documents to get this deal. They kind of brush over that the U S government somehow just like, cause they're like, Oh, it's such a deep vetting process, but two idiots were just able to do it themselves with the computer and Photoshop. <laughs> like, okay, maybe that says more about the government than the, the filmmakers decisions here. But uh, I agree hundred percent. The third act definitely is a little bit weaker again. Some other stuff that I wanted to hit on. Uh, if you just look at the IMDb goofs tab, there's just a few things that they either didn't get right about the story or things that were edited wrong. Or it, it's not like a super clean movie at times. There's there's stuff you can spot that's kind of like, oh, this maybe wasn't the best made. Um, a big thing is they never even went to Iraq, Cody. Is that shocking to you? Did, did you know that the characters never even visited Iraq? Like in real life? Yeah, in real life. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Or that Albania. is tough. Wow. That's a or Albania. Wow. Well, that's uh cutting some points off my ratings here. But <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. I guess I mean it says based off a true story, but it's like every single movie says that and pretty much nothing is ever true. So it's not surprising. Yeah. This was originally uh, a journalist named Guy Lawson wrote an article in Rolling Stone that kind of detailed all of this for the first time. Um, his kind of quote about them missing the mark a little bit. He said, they got a lot of it in, but when you watch the end of the movie, you think it's just about these two guys, but it's not. It's about, it should be about the whole system, essentially. And I, I do agree that's kind of a failing of this movie is at the end of the day, it does frame it as just like this story of two people and it's just these two, two singular guys. But in reality, it's like, there's an overarching system that created this problem. One, it's you know, American imperialism going over to Iraq and Afghanistan and trying to profit off of, you know, oil over there. And then two, American people profiting then further off of that by selling guns and selling weaponry and the American government just letting any random person have a contract and they'll overlook any guidelines just so that they can get their weaponry and guns by any means necessary. And I, I think that's the, the better story here. And I almost think maybe a different filmmaker outside of Todd Phillips connects more to that. Obviously you're telling a story of people, so it's easier to sit down and watch a story about two real people and two people that are interesting, but I think it just doesn't do a good enough job of kind of commenting on the system as a whole. Yeah. And that's super fair. Um, obviously the direction of the movie is, you know, pointed out these characters, but I think you're right. I think, you know, they could have connected more overarching themes like in that third act i think that's where you could have gone and see you know how other people are you know benefiting off this as well 
you know, the government's rolling everything. You don't really hear a ton from the government throughout this movie at all. Um, obviously, we know, like, they're creating wars and <laughs> they're selling everything possible. But I think there's not a ton of commentary on that. It's kind of just focused on, like, this monster of a human and this guy who just got roped into it, kind of. So, more of a character piece. Um, and yeah, I agree. If, if it was somebody else there than Todd Phillips coming off the Hangover trilogy, maybe we would have gotten some more insight into that. But yeah, I, I think with just like the tone and stuff, it, it's not surprising. Like they didn't try to to go any deeper. It's all that good stuff. Move on to the ugly. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear <laughs> to identify the ugly in this movie. Just the general war profiteering actions of the U.S. government at large uh, during the 2000s is is probably pretty ugly and, and pretty easy to condemn a lot of what happens. When you look at this movie in tandem with Vice, especially, I think it does kind of create a good one-two punch. And it it does a because like I think Vice almost goes too much in the other direction. So it's like when you put these two movies together, maybe you can get kind of get a cool full picture of the failings of the US government at that time, post 9-11. Yep. And <laughs> yeah, I think you hit that straight on the head. And, um, I mean, there is just, like, a lot of ugly in this movie, especially since, you know, it is based off true stories about war profiteering and everything. Um, the big ugly I did want to mention, just Jonah Hill's character in general, <laughs> um, is this, like, the worst person I've ever seen on screen? I think he's got to be up there. Like, this is top five worst movie character. Just, like, from a genuine standpoint, like, I don't think there's any redeeming qualities about this guy at all. He just doesn't care um, about anybody except and, you know, for himself. I mean, yeah, which, you know, there are a lot of movie characters about, like, like with that characteristic. But I think he just takes it to the next level by just, like, I don't know, he, he's kind of just, like, playing his friendship up, his friendship up with every single person. He's being a different person around every single new person. Like, that's just obviously um, super sociopathic behaviors in general. I mean, you even have Bradley Cooper as <laughs> a terrible, terrible person. And somehow he ends up being like the nice guy at the end to give Miles Teller all his money. <laughs> like Jonah Hill is still worse than this guy who's a terrorist. He's literally a terrorist and he's still better than Jonah Hill. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's about as ugly as it gets, I think, in, in any movie. But, yeah. Do you think, in terms of the Miles Teller's character's portrayal, I don't want to speak to like the reality of David Packwitz because I don't know exactly what happened, but like, do you think, in the way it's portrayed, he is complicit in these actions or do you think he's more innocent than jonah hill oh no i'd say he's pretty complicit Uh, (laughs) i mean especially when you start getting into the super illegal stuff i mean the chinese bullets like it's just illegal because they all have embargoes and stuff so it's not like terrible terrible but i mean he definitely knew about everything and like is putting this stuff in plans and actions so I, i don't think he's innocent in any part of the word but you know, he's not Jonah Hill at least, so he's got that going for him. I think, I, and I think that's another problem I just have is that, like, at the end of this movie, Bradley Cooper hands this dude, like, a envelope full of cash, and he kind of just, like, I don't understand gets why. Off. Yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't understand why Bradley Cooper would, his character would even do that. It doesn't make, like, he doesn't need to. It, it's just this strange, like, wrap-up of, like, oh, there's a happy story at the end, but it's, like, he was just as bad and i mean he was lying to anna de armas throughout and i don't know yeah i mean that's fair like i probably would have lied about that stuff too uh, right but <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah going back to that i mean i don't know why he gave him money because the deal fell through right so they didn't get all that money but bradley cooper still had a suitcase of you know however much yeah i mean he so, just gave him money he, he was like him, because you didn't rat on me but like yeah he already didn't do it, <laughs> so you don't need to pay him. It'd be one thing if you paid him before I guess, and was like, "Hey, keep this between yeah. us." But I guess that's fair. I mean, he's he's a terrorist, so he has a lot of money. So he's probably just like, you know, this guy's on a do, terrorist but... watch list, Cody. <laughs> I don't see much of a difference, but um, yeah, he, he's probably just like, "Oh, this kid, he knew like if he ratted me out, you know, it'd be big trouble." So. I'll just go help him out. I know, you know, he's still doing this whole misuse thing for some reason. So I guess that kind of makes sense. But uh, like that Bradley Cooper character in real life, you think he's just going to be dishing out money because somebody didn't bring up his name? Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't bet on that. But 
it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Let's move on to weird movie details trivia. Naked grandma! Naked, huh? Uh, my first question was going to be what the name of their smuggler in Iraq was, but you already mentioned, shout out Marlboro. Oh, great character. Marlboro. <laughs> 50-50. <laughs> Love that guy. I think uh, one of the more underrated characters. I should have, I didn't put him in my invite fight night, but I should have put him on a uh, night. I, I just want to knight him preemptively. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have two questions. Do you only have one then? Uh, no, I, I still got three more. So, oh, okay, you started. Then. <laughs> so my first question is: the real David Pakowitz appears in this movie. Who does he play? Mm. Really? And I will Ooh, say it's in the first that's a half. Tough one. Okay, I was gonna guess the dry cleaning guy, but I guess that's not right. I think like there's not that many characters in this movie. So I'm being completely honest. My second thought would have been like people they hired on at their company. Maybe the guy who got fired, but that's kind of the second half too. Um, think the maybe half even first movie? act, first act of the movie. Oh, is it the guy getting massaged? Does he have, does he have his ass out? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is the guy who's singing at the re- retirement home. Don't fear the reaper. <laughs> oh. And the, the owner of the retirement home is like, oh, that's my nephew. He's got real talent. And his nephew is the real David Packwitz singing this awful song to these 80-year-old people. That is funny. He's got a good voice, though, to be fair. So shout out David Packwitz, you know, good singer. But yeah, I wouldn't guess that. that that's pretty good show there. Thank you. Uh, my first question. It's a little bit in homage to one of your Goodfellas questions, going back to Goodfellas again. But I want to know, how long does it take to get to the opening scene? Now, we didn't talk about the opening scene where, um, you know, he's in the trunk of a car, he gets pulled out, he's got a gun to his head. And, um, I, and on the second, on the rewatch as well, I thought it was completely obvious that was Bradley Cooper talking. I don't know if you caught that either. But I feel like if there's any Bradley Cooper fans, that was a pretty like, distinct oh, yeah, voice. Bradley Cooper's going to kill this guy. Yeah. Rocket Rack is anywho, talking to him. <laughs> sorry. Anywho, how long does it take to get to that opening scene in the movie? That's my question. Um, I'm going to look up the runtime of the movie. Is that okay? Yeah, I, I believe it's around two hours. I think it's like and an hour 50. Let me just double yeah, check. Yeah, okay, sure. Hour 54, yeah. And to premeditate, I think Goodfellas... I mean, that movie was like three hours. It, was, and it took like one. It was like, a, yeah, a, an hour into the movie. This is later for sure. I would say hour 20. Yeah, I'll give it to you. I mean, it's like 125, 130, <laughs> somewhere in there. I think it starts at 135. <laughs> so, yeah, I just thought that was interesting just because the good fellows like came pretty early on and this basically waited till the end where I was like, I kind of even forgot this was the opening scene, but I guess we're here now. So, Honestly, until you just mentioned it, I had kind of just like wiped that from my mind that that even <laughs> happened. So, yeah, it's kind of just a shot at the writers and the direction. So I think it's it's really dumb to start off a scene uh, of the movie and then wait an hour and a half to get there. I think that's stupid as hell. Especially an but, hour uh, and a yeah. half in a two hour movie when it's like you're seventy five percent of the way through. Whereas Goodfellas, <laughs> you're like a third of the way through. I think that's acceptable. You get his child. That's a perfect point. Yeah. It, it, it's really good. Yeah. All right. But yeah, I'll, I'll give that to you. You get a point. According to the movie, when can AEY begin beginning, sorry, begin bidding on defense contracts again? This was something I caught I mean, <laughs> just because it's 2022. <laughs> yeah, so are, 2022. They are so eligible. AEY, they're out here probably buying stuff. I think uh, Diveroli is banned from doing business with the government until, was it like 2025 or something? I mean, it's still not that long. Like, <laughs> guy coming back soon too, but he is yeah, out of prison. Detail though, clearly because Carter met him. <laughs> but <laughs> we should pay him a visit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. for sure. He might be paying us a visit <laughs> after this podcast. Honestly, <laughs> true. Hey, uh, real life Ephraim. You know, this is all based off of Jody Hill's performance. You know, nothing personal towards you, but yeah, you're a terrible person. Um, but anyways, my second question, which I think is a softball. And I'm, I'm being nice if you just lobbed me one up. But uh, going to that Jordan scene, what brand of glasses did Jonah Hill try and buy off 
uh, you know, the guy who's helping them with the permit. Do you remember what brand of glasses those are? <laughs> it's uh, Lacoste. Alligator. No, it's yeah. a crocodile. <laughs> I just love that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I know, I like designer shit. <laughs> Alligator. <laughs> no, it's a fucking crocodile. But uh, yeah, shout out Jonah Hill. Love that guy. It's a great line of movie. Just everything in Jordan and just like that entire scene, I, I love. But yeah, shout out that scene. Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, even when Jonah Hill is like saying really despicable stuff, he's like just so fun to watch in this for the most part. I think again, like to the scenes when they've delivered the guns and they're getting the pictures taken of them by that guy. Like it's just a, a fun <laughs> scene where they're just like posing in front of these guys. Like it's so stupid, but it's it's just a ton of fun throughout. Um, my question is, how much weight did Jonah Hill gain for the for this movie? And kind of to place you in the time period, uh, this was came out in 2016. 2014 was 22 Jump Street, so maybe you can kind of think where he was at there. Um, and then Hail Caesar was also 2016. Um, so how much money did he, how much weight did he put on for this role? Yeah, interesting. I think, I mean, 22 Jump Street, uh, I haven't seen Hail Caesar, but I think he's fairly around the same, you know, shape as 22. Um, but in this movie, he's pretty big. So I don't know. I would guess like 55. 44. Not bad guess. Yeah, but I was gonna say fifty. I was gonna say fifty, but yeah, I mean, he did put on a good amount of weight. It, it looked like so. That's not super surprising. I think he looks good though. I think he's like he's he's, he's got this uh you know good air about him, <laughs> swaggy gentleman. <laughs> His hair, the hair and the glasses are cool, but everything else, even the chain um, and the fits. Yeah, the chain's cool too. Even when he's getting ripped off um, in the hood by those guys. They're like, this guy's wearing parachute pants, like goofy looking guy. <laughs> so they're even dogging his, his, like, his fit and everything. But like everything on his head is cool. But once you move past there, I, I'm probably out on that. Yeah. You know, obviously Jonah Hill undergoing a lot of transformations throughout the years has struggled with, you know, putting on and losing weight at different times. But, um, you know, as long as he's healthy and, ha- healthy and happy, I think that's the important thing, right? Yep. And he's gone through a lot of stuff, just like, I mean, physically, <clears throat> people are always asking for him to change how he looks. And especially in his early roles, he was always kind of getting the, the I mean, not the necessarily joke. this, yeah, just like kind of a bunch of fat jokes and stuff. And I know that kind of took a toll on him. There's even been like interviews and stuff where, you know, they've talked about it. So, but yeah, I, I love Jonah Hill, one of the, the better working guys today. And I think just one of the better guys in Hollywood too. So shout out to him too, but and shout out yeah, Beanie Goldstein. <laughs> shout out Beanie as well. You can never leave Beanie out. The whole fam, man. <laughs> and uh, I got one more trivia question. I just came up with this, Cody. What is the name of the j- movie that Jonah Hill directed? Do you know? Yeah, I believe it's called Mid-90s. You know, I do have some movie, movie knowledge up here. You know, every night. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but uh, I think you said it was good, right? Yeah, it's not bad. Um, there is one scene where like a... 12 year old kid has like a sexual moment with a girl who's much older which is a little creepy played by i think alexa demi uh a little strange but otherwise hey it's an a24 lucas hedges in it of course so it's good stuff sure. i'll have to check it out yeah all right let's take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back and we're back with welcome to the academy this, there's a mistake moonlight you guys won best picture this is where we to give our own awards for this movie. And I'm going to give this movie second best movie about how Dick Cheney ruined America. What are your thoughts on that, Cody? Is this movie worse <laughs> than Vice? Dude, that's, I think that's actually a really close one. Um, I think Vice is interesting, but a lot of its concepts kind of fail for me. And this movie is kind of just okay. So <laughs> it's kind of pick whichever one you like. Uh, I think like tone-wise. I might go with War Dogs, honestly, if I'm being completely honest. But yeah, those, those are probably the two best ones. Oh, fair enough. They're they're both pretty <laughs> close for me, generally speaking. But what's your what do you what do you want to give this award? Yeah, yeah. I think Vice is like my least favorite out of a K movie spread. But uh my first uh award, I do want to give this 
it goes specifically to the character of Ephraim. And uh, I'm going to give him the most punchable face in movie history. <laughs> I believe he gets smacked. Well, I think it's only two times, but it feels like a lot more. One in the club and then one at Miles Teller at the end. But uh, I'll tell you what, there are multiple times in this movie where I was like, dude, just deck him in the face. Uh, look at this guy. He's asking for it. <laughs> so, Do you know who punches him the first time? Do you know who that is? Uh, no, no. Is it somebody I should know? It's Dan Bilzerian. Are you familiar with the name i i sadly do know who that is yeah, yeah. Uh, why is he in this movie i don't i mean i guess because it's set in miami and he's rich and or was rich i i can't speak to his monetary value right now also a not a good dude so that no yeah my respect for todd phillips just went down the drain but <laughs> let's hear your next award i'm gonna give miles teller's character the worst significant other award I mean, him and his wife are like going to anti-war protests. Like they're very much against the war. <laughs> and then suddenly he's just like, oh yeah. I mean, I get it. Listen, this is another theme of the movie. It's like for him, he's very desperate. He's put all of his money into a very poor business plan about selling sheets, which I will also give this movie the worst business plan award, uh, selling 400 <laughs> thread count sheets to retirement homes. At, at wholesale value is, is very strange. I, it doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense. And I mean, it doesn't work for him clearly. Uh, but the movie tries to redeem him as like this good husband, good boyfriend when he like, they have the baby and he's like, oh, I'll go get her at night. But like, he continuously lies to her, hides from her every turn, never tells her the truth really ever. And yeah, it's not, not a great look. And I kind of understand why she left him. <laughs> Fair. But I think they ended up together anyway. So who cares? But you have worse significant other in movie history. I don't well, know. Yeah, not in movie history. <laughs> what about like Gone Girl? <laughs> That's probably worse. That's a loving relationship, Cody. <laughs> it's goals. Yeah, true. But uh, yeah, he's a pretty terrible husband. And uh, funny enough, my uh, last award, it kind of has to do with that. It does have to do with Miles Teller. Um, I'm giving this movie the award for the most uh, massage chairs being carried or closed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like after every, you know, uh, you know, sad or kind of thinking scene with Miles Teller where he wants to change his mind, they do it like three times where he's back around carrying a stupid massage table. I just think it's overused. And the amount of times I saw him pack that thing into his trunk was a bit too many. So I wanted to give that a word out. That is true. He's really sulking around with that massage chair, which I guess I probably would be too in his situation, but it is a little bit overused. <laughs> Funnily enough, the storyline about him like selling the sheets isn't even correct either. So the real David Pakowitz didn't sell directly to retirement homes. He bought them and then sold them. He bought them from a manufacturer in Pakistan and then sold them to a supplier who then sold it to retirement homes. And apparently the business was actually mildly successful before he got into the uh, arms dealing business. So that I guess would have just made him look like a worse person. So that's probably why they didn't say that it was like an okay business. I guess it seemed like a complete idiot and failure, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if you make that like a kind of successful business, I feel like that character is kind of just not redeemed because then they're like choosing to, you know, more property <laughs> instead of making an honest living, being a middleman for, for sheets or whatever. But yep. yeah, that's nothing fun. more honest than that. <laughs> <laughs> this David Packwood sounds like a great guy. Uh, learn more about him. So we need to bring him on as well. Just get him and Ephraim together. Might as well. Ooh, reunion pod. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good one. We'll get John Bernthal and those two on here and, and we'll have our own real ones right here. Who, Shane? Yeah, Shane. Cody. <laughs> Didn't accept our invite, unfortunately. Let's move on to... I hope you have soon. That's, that's what next guess. And then. <laughs> by the power vested in me by my father, King Edward. And by all the witnesses here... I dub thee Sir William. I would invite Shane, but he won't come on. So instead, I'm going to pick the um, the dry cleaner guy. I don't know his, his character name or whatever, but the rat. I think he'd have some interesting stories. The fucking rat. The rat, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the fucking rat, but uh, this guy is the rat, and I think he'd be very happy to tell us about why you are the rat. <laughs> 
I think the exchange with him that I really like is when he he has the the mic on and everything. He really does just get all the information he would ever need to close the case. So I thought that was really funny, just because they thought they were taking advantage of you know this dumb dry cleaner guy the entire movie. Then he kind of turned his on his head. So I just want to hear from what he has to say. There's not a ton of like super likable characters in this movie. So I thought he'd be the best one to have on the pod. Yeah, I agree. It was really hard to choose somebody considering the lack of likable characters. So um, I'm not trying to get put on any watch lists or anything by saying this, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to invite Henry Gerard onto the podcast just because I think the <laughs> stories and, you know, I wouldn't want to meet him in person, but if we could meet through a screen, uh, you know, thousands of miles apart, I think that could, could you know, create some good content for sure. That is true. I mean, we, we might need to get better Wi-Fi because I don't think this guy's allowed in the country, but <laughs> <laughs> he'd have some good stories. I mean, allegedly, he's the guy who sold the rope that they hung Saddam Hussein on, according to this movie. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a lot you could get into with him. <laughs> true, true. And um, if you want to move on to fight here, uh, that's 100% who I think it is. Uh, Bradley Cooper, he's got the glasses. You know, it, it's Bradley Cooper. He's you got a nice enough face or whatever. But, uh, I mean, for for this category, I feel like you really have two choices. <laughs> and I already said Jonah Hill has a super punchable face. So I'm just going to go after the, the terrorist guy. Um, you know, he, he's now out of the country, really, or the face for a couple of days, it seems, or or Miami for, for whatever reason. And, uh, yeah, just seems like a bad guy. Uh, the specific moment where I'd pick to do it as well would be at the very end. So I was Miles Teller. She'd be like, hey, uh, you know, what happened in Albania, dude? And he's going to say, no more questions. And then I'd pick up the briefcase and just deck him. So that'd be my specific moment as well. Yeah, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight uh, against American imperialism. <laughs> and I'm going to take a stand against <laughs> that. Not in a physical altercation. You're taking out a big fight. I have a feel that. I have a feeling... Uh, I may lose that one, but at least with my thoughts and my words, I will uh, combat against that. It sounds like um, you're like running a congressional campaign or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> vocal 2024. This doesn't work out for me, and then I, that'll be my backup plan. <laughs> I just have to stay true to my uh, values yeah. right now. True. I'll run your campaign. I think we could we could win pretty easily. It's not that hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm 100% down, Cody. I, I say, I mean, we could be running mates. I think that that's probably an even better idea. So, oh, you want me in your vice? I'll pull some Dick Cheney moves there. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Let's move on to night. <laughs> Cody, Cody, who are you going to night? Yeah, I think I have the best night, uh, maybe of, of the season so far. I'm going to go with, oh, I didn't look on his name. It's the Armenian driver who gets killed off for no reason. Um, just a heck of a guy, and uh, he has limited screen to bash him. There it is, bash him. You've been knighted by Cap, but uh, yeah. And the, the sad thing is, like, he's such a nice guy. He helps him, you know, jump through some of these hoops. You know, obviously, he's a part of this illegal activity or whatever. But I mean, he's in Albania. What else are you going to do? Um, and then he just gets he gets offed off camera with no explanation, um, which is tough because I, I did like the character. So I want to give him his due diligence and, and knight him. Hey, I back it 100%. That's my pick as well. Uh, you, oh, did wow. say, you did say he was Armenian uh, at the beginning of that. He's Albanian. I, I said Albanian. I said that. <laughs> roll I, well, <laughs> yeah, roll the tape, but I, I meant to say Albanian. It's the Armenian driver who gets, it's the Armenian, the Armenian. Rest in peace, Sebastian. Kind of, I mean, I guess I'm assuming that's a real plot point pulled. Well, they didn't go to Albania, so I don't really know. There's, there's yeah, no closure not. here. The dude just disappears <laughs> and he's never heard from again. And his poor wife, who in the yeah. movie, her character is speaking Romanian, even though they're, that's kind of a, a goof of the movie that they just like have this woman, which I guess obviously neither of us knew that. I just read that online. But like, hey, get it right. Get someone who can speak Albanian if you're going to have them cry about their <laughs> husband who's been murdered. You definitely could tell that she was speaking Romanian. You thought that you didn't have to go to IMDb for that one. Take some credit. Come on. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. I'm 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 very uh, adept in the uh, differences between the uh, Albanian and Romanian languages. So eh, I just don't like to brag about it usually. So <laughs> makes sense. But yeah, shout out Bascom. Shout out Bascom's wife. R.I.P. Yeah. 
All right, the recast. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. I think, I've, I guess I've alluded to it throughout, but let's just see Adam McKay direct this movie, Cody. Uh, I think at times he can be overindulgent and a little bit excessive, but I think at this point in his career, especially, I mean, this is right after the big short, which I think is his best movie, in my opinion. Uh, I think he oh, yeah. could put a, the spin that I wanted on this movie. Um, I think he would add to it. So, yeah, no. And I didn't even think about that, but that is a really good point. Just because like we were talking earlier, like he would bring in the bigger issues, I think in the third act. So yeah, I think that's the perfect choice. And, uh, I mean, he, he kind of did uh, do it in a different way with the vice, just from a different angle. But yeah, I think that would be very cool to see him during this movie. Yeah, my recast, uh, my first one, I am uh, going to take Ana de Armas out, sadly. Uh, I think performance-wise, I mean, it's kind of hard to pick on here because the main two are good and there's not that many characters, really. So I'm taking her out. And uh, for this particularly, particular moment in time, 2016, I'm going to throw in ScarJo. Uh, I think I've thrown her in a bunch of other times. Um, I think she's very underrated. I think she very is. Uh, you know, shout out The Prestige, obviously. But I think what her came out in like 2015. So, I mean, this is prime, like, I feel like acting chops wise for her, at least in that sense. So, I think she'd be good in this, you know, give that character a little bit more, you know, gravitas, a little bit more something. I, I don't know. It's kind of just, that character is weird to me in this movie, but yeah, Charlotte Scargo, let's get her in everything. Charlotte Johansson, good actress, um, you know, known for taking minority roles away from people. So good pick by you, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> hey, I mean, Stop. keep it consistent with, with ScarJo. Keep it consistent with her career. I respect that. <laughs> My pick, like you said, there's not a lot of good characters. So realistically, this is like too big of a name for too small of a role. But the army sergeant in Baghdad, uh, I'm picking Willem mm-hmm. Dafoe to come in and just play him for five minutes in a scene. Uh, Willem Dafoe is a fun actor. And I feel him, I mean, him as like an army sergeant is, is always great. So it's been done a few different times. But uh, yeah, put Willem Dafoe in this movie. Uh, I love that. Uh, <laughs> you recast. I'll tell you what, you got better at the recast recently because <laughs> those are two very good picks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can put Willem Dafoe in any role in this, in this uh, film and I'd probably back it. But, uh, yeah, my second pick. Um, I am actually going to get rid of Jonah Hill. You know, I do love the guy. But I want somebody with um, a little bit more comedic timing. Uh, I want the character maybe going a little bit direction. I mean, different direction, excuse me. So I'm going to go with Danny DeVito. I think he's perfect for this whole, you know, <laughs> not the gravitas that ScarJo is bringing. But a different kind of role, I think. And he'd really make it fun. He, he, he'd be more into like insulting Miles Teller, I think. Uh, and then his interaction with the government, I'd love to see as well. So let's just stick Danny to be that way. Why not? What age? Like 2016? <laughs> how, yeah, however old he, he was in 2016. He's timeless. He's timeless, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Shout out the Penguin. <laughs> uh yeah i think we should probably move on <laughs> after that's all dude i i feel like this movie's cast is pretty you know it is really solid. good it's it's tough i sh- i struggled yeah. as well i i i understand so so i went for a joke if you couldn't tell <laughs> i uh i thought about throwing adam sandler in as the laundromat guy uh you know again just oh that would have been perfect iconic jewish actors let's let's get at the sandman in here man oh that too yeah no that's great like i should have thought about that honestly I'm losing my touch in the recast, man. You're, you're taking over the, the good apart. recast. So. No Zazie beats for the, <laughs> for the wife. I mean, for the, for the girlfriend. That also would have been better picked. Well, the first time it would have been. Know, I thought I wasn't allowed to pick her anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> Dave Batista would have been perfect as well. But, you know, whatever. Dave Batista is Ephraim. I actually feel like he could probably do that. Mm, I would have liked to see him uh, probably in the uh, whatever you call it role. Uh, <laughs> oh, he would have been good as Bashkum, actually. Shit. All right, yeah. Let's go Dave Batista, Bashkum, Adam Sandler, Dry Cleaner. That's perfect. There we go. We've we've reinvented this whole cast. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our rating. You're going to look at me and you're going to tell me that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? Of course, we do our ratings out of 69. I'm curious to kind of see where you place this, Cody. 
apparently it's gone down as the episode has has progressed so where did you decide to land yeah i don't know this is i feel like this is one of the harder ones um at least in my head to rate because it is an enjoyable watch but i don't think it's the best movie you know in my notes i had it at a 51 but i think that's a little harsh i'm gonna go with a 53 out of 69 wow you went up honestly uh i'm lower than that uh for me this is like yeah. just it's like like i said it's a very fun watch at the beginning of the movie but I don't think it hits quite on as hard on the themes as it could also don't really think it has a ton of heart to it. That's something we haven't talked about, but like in terms of like emotional investment and in like making you really want to care and see these characters succeed at, at points, it doesn't do a great job of doing that. So I'm going to stick it at a 45, uh, which, you know, is still pretty middle of the road. It's a little bit above the middle, but um, I think it's respectable for this movie. Um, it's weird because like, like I said, it's, it's one that I think is more rewatchable than some of the movies we've had. Um, but in terms of yeah. like, quality and how much I enjoyed the final product, um, I don't think it's as successful. And I, th- I think something about rewatching movies that aren't perfect, there's there's something to be said about that as well like you can enjoy a movie that's bad and you can look at some of the things and you can still enjoy it and kind of even enjoy it for some of those reasons as you watch it yeah and i think for me just like sometimes the fun scenes kind of just stick out in my head so maybe that's it why definitely is like in your memory a little more. it's a movie that stands out in your memory yeah it's more of a, a memory of a couple scenes than the whole movie altogether i think yeah I mean, I'll, I'll 100% say, like, I watched this uh, last year, I think, again, maybe about a year ago around this time, um, and I gave it three stars on Letterbox. and then, like, as the months have gone on, I keep, like, I'll think back on it, and I'm like, did I really not like it that much? Like, I feel like I enjoyed that movie so much more, but I only gave it three stars, and then I rewatch it, and I'm like, okay, yeah, there are some good moments, but, like, I understand why I maybe hate on yeah <laughs> so I, I think it's good you got to come back to it occasionally to remember why it's not as good as you think it might be Definitely. you know what dude i'm changing my score back to 51 i'm changing it <laughs> <laughs> hey we haven't left the, the category yet so there you're it's still loud <laughs> the notes have spoken 51 <laughs> all right well we're gonna move on where you uh have a second thought we we'll move on to <laughs> defeat the watch list watch me, watch me. Ooh, watch me, watch me. cody have you seen nope yet <laughs> I'm not big man up yet. No. Well, let's move on to your watch list. What do we yeah, have to check out? So uh, I did watch Short Term 12, uh, as we discussed two weeks ago on the pod. Really interesting movie in terms of like the career that a lot of people involved with it had afterwards. I mean, this movie has three future Oscar nominees, two of which won Oscars in Rami Malek, yeah. Lakeith Stanfield, and Brie Larson. Um, this has got to be like one of Lakeith Stanfield's first movie roles i mean he's going by keith stanfield in this he's, he's not even lakeith at this point um he's kind really? of playing a kid um the story is one that is deals a lot in trauma and childhood trauma it's about um essentially like a group home similar to like not necessarily like a juvie but like kind of a, a place before that for kids who are both you know don't have families to go to and maybe situations where their families can't take care of them for certain reasons, but the cast is, is super solid beyond even those three that I mentioned. I mean, you've got Caitlin Deaver, who's continued to have a successful career in recent years. Um, Stephanie Beatrice, who Booksmart. was in Brooklyn Nine Nine, yeah, Caitlin Dever in, in, in Booksmart. Um, John Gallagher Jr., who's showed up in various different things, notably Ten Cloverfield Lane, um, but. I wouldn't call this movie fun necessarily. Um, it's definitely deals in some heavy subject matter, abuse, uh, parents dying, drugs, abortion, childhood trauma, child, well, yeah, just, like just a lot of stuff, but I, I would say it's pretty good. And then of course it is also directed by Destin Daniel Crichton. It's very much like an indie darling film and it's understandable with kind of the directors that Marvel took he directed this and just mercy it, it's not too surprising that they picked him to take on chung chi um and i am excited to see what uh, avengers king dynasty would have i would say if you're not averse to those subject matters definitely check out this movie i think it's a good watch and it's got a lot of fun faces in it at very early stages in the career but if it's you know something if that kind of stuff doesn't appeal to you or you don't like watching movies with that then definitely stay away from it 
there. And uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, just over you're describing it, it seems like a movie that I'd actually like. So kind of just like a career introspective as well on, on some of these you know, young actors. So shout out Keith Stanfield. I, I didn't even know <laughs> he wasn't going by like Keith early in his career. That, that's super interesting. Yeah, and he's pretty good in this too. He does a little, he has a little like freestyle rap moment. Um, his character's oh. kind of is, it, it's interesting because it's, it's very much an ensemble cast. Brie Larson and John Gallagher Jr. are like the two main leads and they're like r- helping run this group home. Keith is one of the, the kids there, but his storyline is very important there. Caitlin Deaver's storyline is very important. There's another child who comes in. Um, it, it's cool to see how they interweave these things. Rami Malek is, there's basically no point for him to even be there. He's basically like this, he, he's almost the POV character where he's like this wide-eyed new worker that shows up and you meet, are there on his first day, but you don't really stick with mm-hmm. him throughout. So it's, it's just a little strange. Interesting. Yeah. Rami never gets the best roles anyways, but. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Cody. Uh, let's uh, pick the movie for, for next week. Now I, I have a request. Yeah. It has to be an eighties movie because uh we, we might have some 80s stuff coming up. So give me an 80s movie to watch. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, well, let's just, let's do the year thing again. You want to do that? Sure. I, I'm feeling mid 80s. I think that's the, the peak of the 80s. Let's go 1984. Um, Ooh, George Orwell? <laughs> yeah, good book. I actually like that book. One of the few books that I have read it. Um, but... <laughs> No, I'm joking. But um, I think a decent year of movies as well. But I think I want to go like a horror thriller kind of category. All right. If we well, can go in that there's, ele- there's 11 films. So we'll see if one of okay. them applies. So we'll, we'll check horror first. Um, there's Gremlins. So that's option one. And I'll see if there's a thriller. <laughs> okay. That's not even horror, though. Well, by genre. <laughs> <laughs> um and then for thriller your options body double and blood simple so any of those uh calling out to you yeah we'll go gremlins <laughs> gremlins all right that's such a fun movie i love that movie <laughs> yeah uh so yeah i will watch gremlins and then uh we'll report back next week and then uh to our audience definitely continue uh go check out some 80s movies because we'll we'll definitely be talking about them in the upcoming weeks True. And go catch it. Go uh, catch Nope as well, because I will watch it for the next episode. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Time for we have a pod rhythm. Where we're gonna draw a card, and then we're gonna give our hot takes. We're gonna talk about it for thirty seconds, and uh, the card is Mad Max. Technically, Ooh. it's the original, but we can just we can talk about yeah. Fury Road because we make the show and we, we decide. So Cody, take it away. <laughs> yeah. You know, Mad Max is one of the more interesting franchises. I think um, the first one's kind of more of a grounded thing. Road Warriors. Great. The third one's bonkers. And that's why they didn't make one for another 30 years, but uh, Fury Road might be more bonkers. Uh, not particularly, but the Fury Road is a ridiculous film. And I haven't rewatched it since we watched it. Well, we watched it together for the first time, which is really funny. But uh, yeah, it's wild. I mean, half the crap I don't even understand. You got that Joe guy who, you know, he's got milk and stuff. I don't know half of it, but the action's insane. You know, the stunts are incredible and it looks amazing. And it's basically just an hour and a half of, you know, a chase to the desert. So you can't really ask for anything else other than, you know, really weird characters. So shout out. That was George Miller, right? correct? I always get him in the. Uh, what this face uh, mixed up, but whatever. Shout out it George. Is, it is okay. George Miller. You're right. Director of Happy Feet. Benicio. <laughs> yeah, I always get George Miller and uh, Benicio del Toro. No, Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro. <laughs> you know, Benicio is the, the worst performance of all time in uh, The Last Jedi. Guillermo del Toro. There it is. Both great directors. But yeah. Um, I want to kind of talk about the new Mad Max Fury Road or Mad Max Furiosa movie that's going to be coming out in 2024. Um, and the fact that they recast Furiosa, we're not getting Charlie Theron. Anya Taylor Joy is going to be playing our Furiosa, and uh, you know I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think uh, Charlie's is you know obviously a great action star and a pretty good actress, and 
it's it's a prequel film, but it's not like Anya Taylor Joy is so much younger that you needed to recast it. Um, it's also got Chris Hemsworth and uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen though, so I'm sure it's going to be uh, interesting. And uh, I probably need to rewatch Fury Road because, like you said, I I didn't understand what was going on whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, the plot doesn't particularly make sense. All I know but is Nicholas Holt get... is like playing a guitar and yeah. No, that's wrong. No, Nicholas Holt's not playing a guitar. What's he doing? He's chained to something? <laughs> he's just thirsty. He's a driver. But yeah, yeah his lips go. are just little parts. <laughs> but um, that is dumb. I, first off, I hate prequels. And um, I feel like Charlize is so good in that movie. Why would you not bring her back? But yeah, I'm sure it'll be good. But weird choices. All right, and now time for our final segment, our recommendations. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. I'll start with recommendations. I'm not going to really talk about any movies because I've been beginning to watch some 80s movies. So I'll just say in general, go check out 80s movies. I won't spoil anything right now because... Uh, I don't want to give Cody any pointers for, for what may happen, but uh, I do want to say, Cody, have you ever seen Risky Business? Uh, no, it's Tom Cruise movie, right? I've seen the scene of him dancing around. Right, but... yeah, who hasn't? Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was so bad. Like, I thought it was, like, genuinely a bad movie. <laughs> Tough on Tommy. Uh, but people seem to really enjoy it. I, I just don't get it. I'm not sure um, what, I miss, what I'm missing. Uh Essentially, his parents go away from a weekend and he starts running a uh, brothel out of his house as a high school student. <laughs> and then it's like a good flick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it reminds me of Ferris Bueller's Day Off in a lot of ways, um, but less fun. Uh, it's all <laughs> more cokey. Someone described it as um, definitely more <laughs> horny than Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And there's no Ferris. It's only Cameron. And I think Tom Cruise is also like the dumbest, mo- like his character is the dumbest person I've like ever seen on screen. Like he's just a complete idiot. At every turn, he makes the wrong decision. I don't know. Um, well, I, ha- I have you, been watching. You really movie. dislike that movie. <laughs> yeah, I, re- I really don't like it. But So I will not be picking it. <laughs> in a few weeks but uh, on top of that i have been watching some tv i did a few weeks ago watch with mina the first season of abbott elementary just won emmys so it, it's you know a well-loved show it's coming back for season two i'm not super high on it but it definitely is cool in terms of the way it kind of displays being like a teacher especially a teacher in public schools in america um, and it, it's pretty accurate representation of that, I would say. And then the other one is uh, I watched the first season of Only Murders in the Building with uh, the, the oh, two nice. Martins and Selena Gomez. And that was pretty fun as well. So been in the TV grind a little bit recently. Yeah, okay, respect there. And uh, yeah, that is something I want to check out because I do like uh, Steve Martin and uh, what's that guy's name? Martin Short. <laughs> yeah, Martin Short, obviously. Uh, whenever I say one of their names, I can never think of the other one. I always reason. think Martin Lawrence, but, <laughs> and that's not Martin Lawrence. <laughs> Bad boys. But uh, yeah, that is something I want to check out. So it's cool. But uh, yeah, pretty much my big wreck for the week. I did finish up Succession season one. I thought it was interesting. Um, I don't know if I love the ending, if I'm being completely honest. But yeah, it, it kind of just seems out of place for the season as a whole. But I did like the first season a lot. I think the characters are, are very good. And uh, it wrapped up like all of the season long arcs really cool, I thought. I think Greg might be my favorite character. Love that guy. Shout out Greg. Um, and then Tom, like officially coming into the family too. I think in, in the upcoming season, that's going to be a massive point. So uh, yeah, I really like all the actors. And Logan Roy, I feel like him healthy um, has been really cool to see. Because I think feel like the first half of the season, you know, you don't know if he's, you know, mentally even sane. Um, but here in the back half, he he's shown off, you know, why he's this big guru. So I will be binging <laughs> the next few seasons fairly quickly, I would assume. So we'll get weekly updates on those. Well, I'm excited but to hear that. I mean, I, yes, I'm, I missed out on She-Hulk and House of Dragons. So I'll talk about both those next week, too. Yeah, we'll... Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have my report about House of Dragons as well, for sure. <laughs> my, uh, 
my last recommendation for the people is is another podcast is the a24 podcast cody have you ever checked out any of the stuff that they're doing over there i did not tell me about it yeah so it's really interesting obviously we're both fans of a24 but they're basically just doing podcasts where they either it's mostly just sticking to like random people together to have a conversation that are like somewhat related to the a24 kind of as a whole. So uh, they just did an episode in July was their most recent one. So they're not super like, it's not like a weekly thing by any means. They maybe do them monthly mm-hmm. or every couple months, but they did uh, Isabella Rosalini and Willem Dafoe last July. Um, but then the directors of Everything Everywhere All at Once, the two Daniels, Daniel Schreiner and Daniel Kwan did an episode with Daniel Radcliffe, which I just listened to, which was pretty good. Um, they did that over the summer. Um, they directed him in Swiss Army Man, so they have that connection, but it was kind of cool to the, hear them talk about everything, everywhere all at once with Daniel Radcliffe, just kind of a fun conversation. Um, there's an episode with Simon Rex, who was in Red Rocket, and Angus Cloud, who have a conversation together, who is the dude from Euphoria that everyone loves. Uh, there's, yeah, yeah, the drug dealer. There's Hunter Schaefer and Lord again, just kind of a weird pairing, but a, a good conversation. Uh, Jenny Slate and Nick Kroll, which are two people like lifelong friends, but another fun conversation ahead of Marcel the Shell coming out. Um, and then one that I that kind of pulled me back into it recently is Nathan Fielder and Alexa Demi, which again is just like two random people uh, having a conversation that is, is just really fun to listen to in a podcast. So check out the A24 podcast. Cause I think there's probably an episode that you'll enjoy. There's at least one grouping of people that you can, you could probably find that you relate to. So. Yeah. That actually sounds pretty good. Cool. Some of those pairings are awesome. Daniel Radcliffe and everything you for all once directors and, uh, Nathan Fielder is one of my uh, personal favorites as well. So I have to go check that out too, but yeah, that actually sounds pretty interesting. All right. We will uh, catch you next week with another podcast episode. It's been a pleasure. Follow us at Cat Podcast everywhere. Peace. What you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul.